I've always had passions for things that involved activities where you were outside. I've driven big boat. I've had big boats over the years. I flew airplanes for 800 hours. For some reason, racing for the past 15 years has been a passion for me. When I get up in the mornings, I, I just kind of start thinking about racing. Now, one of the reasons for that is I don't know how many more years I can do this uh, or am going to want to do this, but right now, it's my passion. I was born and raised in Richmond, Virginia, and I grew up in a blue collar neighborhood off of, uh, on Libby Avenue. You know, I've known Dan uh, all my life. We lived next door together on Libby Avenue, and we've grown up together and had arguments together and everything else. Grace and Murphy and I used to race when we were in high school, just our, our street cars, and we, we did what's known as drag racing. It's a straight line, quarter of a mile or an eighth of a mile run. And uh, we did that back in the 70s. Life stepped in and, and putting our kids through schools and colleges and things. And uh, basically we walked away from drag racing. I used to be a computer operator back in the early, uh, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, and then I got into real estate, sold real estate for a while back in 73 when the interest rates were out of sight. Couldn't sell anything, so I started fooling with cars again. I just got hooked on, so to speak, and uh, just kept working at it. And then I decided, you know what, I'm doing this. I want to start my own business. So in 1976, I officially went into business for myself. And uh, I've been doing it ever since. After I'd been in this line of work for a while, and, and got the business up where I could afford to do some things, I started uh, racing again. About 15 years ago, Grayson and I saw an ad on the internet for a race car that was for sale, so we decided to buy that car together. So we bought a 1969 yellow Corvette that used to belong to a, a pretty famous driver named Dick LaHaye. We restored that car and took turns driving it it was one of those situations where we both wanted to drive and we only had one car. That didn't work too well because we both wanted to drive. So then we said, well, let's hook up and buy another car and then we'll both have a car to drive. Then we bought a second car, which was a 1968 Corvette. Dan and I have worked as a partnership uh, and it's gone along pretty well and we've had great help from other racers uh, that really deserve a lot of the credit. Uh, Dan and Grayson, um, they almost probably couldn't function unless they are together as a team. They, they really do. They, they shine when they're together. Their driver, Calvin, his role as a driver doesn't just stop there. Uh, you'll see him countless times if Dan needs help on his car, Calvin's over there helping Dan and vice versa. If Calvin or Grayson needs help, you know, Dan's the first one there. When you have a partnership with somebody, you've got to trust who's working on your vehicle because that vehicle is going pretty fast and, and things can happen down track that could be uh, extremely uh, bad. So we have to trust each other. When we're doing work on the cars in the morning to prep them, we all give ourselves a job. So somebody's gonna fuel the car, somebody's gonna, gonna flow the nitrous, somebody's gonna make sure the battery charger is plugged up, somebody's gonna make sure the air pressure in the tires is right. The tires are crucial because the, the 34 inch tires um, are about 17 inches wide on these cars. And believe it or not, they only hold about five to five and a half pounds of air. So if somebody's a quarter of a pound off on the air, um, it could, change the behavior of that car when it launches. So we trust each other for the, for the jobs, but we also assign each other jobs. So we've probably campaigned um, 
I would say nine or ten race cars, uh, and we kept upgrading. and And uh, Murphy would buy faster, faster cars with bigger motors, and the sport got a little more dangerous and uh, a little more exciting at the same time. In the springtime, when we take the cars out, we start looking at the schedules, which are posted usually in February. We decide which tracks we want, want to go to and which tracks we're definitely going to, and we lay it out on the calendar. He loves the sport, as, as I do, but he's, he is so passionate about it that uh, he goes, above and beyond uh, what most people will do to get something done. Over the past 15 years, I have probably averaged somewhere in the neighborhood of 90 to 100 trips down the track a year. Conservatively, I've made about 1,300 trips down the track without a scratch on anything. And that in itself uh, even surprises me. That'll bring up the Corvette of Dan Osborne on the left-hand side out of Glen Allen, Virginia. The Agitator, Murphy's Auto Center, foam to size machine. And good Recently, I went to Summit Motorsports Park in Ohio, uh, which is about 10 hours from home, and participated in an event that uh, had three qualifying runs. I was at the shop uh, unable to go to that race I was a little concerned about Dan. He had gone by himself, didn't have our, our normal crew with him, um, which really is bad in the event something bad does happen. And that day they were running um, the race and they were broadcasting it. And it was right at lunchtime and I st I'd stopped. I said, you know, I'm gonna watch a little bit of qualifying and uh, they called Dan Osborne's name and that got my attention so I sat down in front of the computer to watch his run. Everything seemed normal as I did the burnout and did the lunch. car left like it should have, it left in front of my competitor, uh, everything felt good. Dan Osborne, it looks like he had some problems with the starting line. The car left, it looked good. The announcer said that Dan had had a problem on the starting line. Well, he had mistakenly used Dan's name instead of the other opponent. Dan's car left fine. Once I got to the finish line, something mechanical happened to the car. It gets to the other end of 452, 157. Erica Coleman coasting on down the Purnell Body Shop Camaro at 540. A little past the finish line, I was shocked that I thought I saw what looked like a puff of smoke. At that point, the car made a really abrupt turn. It was heading towards the guardrail. As I was trying to slow down, the car was running in excess of 150 miles an hour, and it basically took a hard right turn into the wall from the left lane all the way across both lanes and into the, the concrete wall. Dan did a good job of, of preventing it from nosing in. He actually turned 180, uh, which in turn, the car hit the wall with that side impact. It hurt my shoulder and my, my lower arm uh, quite a bit and basically came to a stop with the driver's door pinned against the wall. So I'm probably going to have to go out and take a look at things there as uh, we've talked you have that kind of speed and you make contact with something dead into the side of the car, your body goes that way. Um, that's where you end up with neck injuries, shoulder injuries. Um, so my first concern really was about him and I hope he was okay. The rescue team arrived within a minute of me resting against the wall and started making sure that the car was secure, covering it with fire extinguishers to make sure that there were no fires breaking out. And one of the workers came up to me and looked in the car and asked me if I was okay. Once they 
got to him and then announced the driver's okay, well, you don't always know what that means. That means, okay, he's alert, he's, you know, uh, he's still with us anyway. I was sitting here working and I got a phone call from Don Rudd and he had asked me if I had heard of Dan wrecking his car and I said, oh no. So I went on and got on a computer on full racing and pulled it up and watched it, reviewed it. And it was kind of terrifying. The race was on live feed. So several of my friends were watching the race itself and somebody could have seen that accident live and maybe even called my wife. Once I was felt a little better that, that okay, he's, he's not hurt bad, my next concern then went to, oh my gosh, there's nobody there to help him. He has no way to get his equipment. He's got a wrecked car. Um, you can't drive it in the trailer. Someone's going to have to somehow winch it or drag it and pull it, which is going to take a lot of help and a lot of people. At that point, all I wanted to do is talk to my wife. I, I just wanted to just give her a call and let her know everything was okay. He's at that point seven, eight hours away from home. Um, it's not like somebody can just jump in a car and be there. At that point, uh, I had some really good friends that were already loading my stuff up in the, in the trailer, putting my golf cart away and taking uh, what was left of my car and dragging it up in the trailer. And I was, uh, I was able to call my wife. He texted me and let me know that he was okay and everything was good. So that made me feel better. And uh, so all that worked out, thank goodness. <laughs> the good Lord was looking out for him. And quite frankly, it was quite humbling that uh, people that you may not even hardly known uh, were over there to help you load up. I mean, it was probably a one hour process and they just told me to just sit on in a chair and they would take care of everything for me. That's part of the family that we have in racing. We're, we're taking a lot of risk. This, this is a dangerous sport and luckily, um, you know, we've got equipment now that's better than it ever has been. We've got, you know, they're, they're building better cars, they're, the, the safety equipment's better. My wife, uh, Dana's first, uh, one of her first comments when I got home is maybe this is a sign it's time to stop. And my response was, I really don't want to go out like that. Uh, I'm still passionate about the sport. It didn't happen for 1,300 runs and the safety equipment did its job. Everybody understands that this is a dangerous sport, but at the same time, people all the time come up to me and ask me, were you scared when your car got sideways? Were you scared when it wiggled at the big end? The answer is no. There's just not time for it and the fear comes after you get in and after you look back at what happened or you look at a video, uh, that's when you get scared. There's risk in everything that you do. There's risk in driving down the interstate. There's risk, risk in driving to work. There's risk in stepping out of the shower. But nobody really thinks about the danger of the sport because things that happen to people in this sport are very, very few and far between. We may or may not fix the, the car that I just wrecked. We may use it as an opportunity to move into another car. Um, obviously, you gotta crunch some numbers, but either way, I'm gonna be back racing again. Since this car has been in an accident, uh, the tags have been cut off, the expiration tags. When you have an accident, the safety workers automatically take the tags off of the window net uh, and the seat belt.
So that's what they do. They cut them out so that you've got to buy new ones because they've been stressed. The cars themselves have a three-point harness that straps us in. They have to be replaced every two years, and they have to be certified. Uh, they have smaller seats, but when you're running nitrous, you have to run a 15-layer suit. This jacket in its, itself weighs uh, probably somewhere around four or five pounds. You put this on before you put the helmet on, and this, this again, uh, it's made out of Nomex and it cuts the fire down as, as uh, if you have a fire in, in uh, going down the track. Same with the, with the gloves. The most important thing and the thing that would have saved Dale Earnhardt's life, this is a Hans device. And this has to be sent back and recertified every four years. And basically this is designed to strap onto you. Your seat belts come across the top. And then it's got straps that hold the helmet. So basically what happens is when you tighten this down, your head can't snap back and it can't go from side to side because the helmet itself has these latches that snap through this strap. So basically it makes your shoulders and your head one unit and it can only turn about that much instead of snapping your, snapping your neck. Very, very important. Looking at Dan's car and going over it, he should not try to repair that car. There's so much damage, I think he'd be better off finding another car or doing something of that nature. I've got another car that I'm gonna let Dan use uh, and so he can make the next race, hopefully. Three weeks later, we're at Maryland International Raceway with another car. We decided that we weren't going to try to repair the old car. There was too much damage. Grayson Murphy was nice enough to uh, provide a car that had been in storage for the past five years. We worked uh, nights and weekends and got that put together. We rewired it. We put my engine and my transmission in it. Coming out on the track after my, my accident a month ago, I was a little bit nervous. I had to let go of the button. I wasn't that familiar with the car. It went straight down the track. I didn't have any issues at all. So. That gave me uh, quite a sense of relief. Today, we're gonna spray it with about five or 600 more horsepower. So um, I will probably still be a little bit nervous, but I know the car is gonna go straight. When we spray nitrous, which is uh, an additive that really helps turn these cars on, we usually try to spray them pretty hard on the first qualifier so that we, we're not under pressure for the next two qualifying runs. Calvin Butler is uh, Grayson Murphy's number one driver. He's won several uh, championships. He is probably the most awesome driver that I've ever seen before. And uh, he's got nerves of steel and ice water in his veins. Yes, I do love the speed. From where we started out at, we started out at, at nine seconds and now we're down to four seconds. It's a tremendous amount of difference, but it costs a lot of money too to run this stuff. I met Grayson and them in 2007 at Rockingham. 2008, the economy went bad. I got rid of all my stuff. Grayson Murphy called me and asked me to come down and drive one, test one of his cars one weekend at Maryland where we're at now. I won the race that weekend. 
I've been driving for him ever since. We won the division championship 11 and 12 back to back and probably have won 60, 70 races. Systems Pro Junior Dragsters. Cool Shirt Systems Pro Junior Dragsters presented by Philadelphia Racing Products. We need you to the staging lanes for your final round of qualifying. Here at the PDRE events, they post a schedule, and the schedule starts with uh, Junior Dragsters, which is actually six and eight, 15 year old kids in, in small dragsters. On the day that we get to race, we have what's called qualifying runs. With the top sportsman class, we are actually required to make three qualifying passes. For instance, if the first 32 cars run 440 or faster and you run a 442, you're going home without getting to race. So it's really important that you qualify well, that you have all your equipment good to go, and you do have three chances. Michael Rose Jr. When we get a call, all hell breaks loose. We have to start towing the cars up there. We have to make sure the batteries are up, make sure we're full of nitrous. The drivers have to suit up. Today, fortunately, it's going to be in the mid 80s. Uh, I've been here before when it was 105 degrees. So the, the 15 layer suits that you put on are not quite as painful as as they are when it's 105 degrees. When it's time to go, usually we've had uh, 30 or 45 minutes to get the car ready to go. Uh, a lot of times there's a last minute issue that pops up. That throws you off your game a little bit, uh, gets on your nerves. When it's time to go, you have to just shut off everything that you just went through to get ready to go and buckle up your, your seat belts and say it's race time. Our race is only 660 feet long. There's about another 1,400 feet of area past the finish line that we can get the car slowed down. Uh, if everything works okay, you're slowed down way before the turnoff. Yeah. There's a lot in between uh, the starting line and the finish line that could happen. So all of your senses are just on red alert. I mean, you're, you're pumped up, you're good to go, you know the car is good, 
but you're listening for every little thing that could happen. a burnout we go through the water box we put the car in gear lock the front brake get the tires spinning and we spin the tires literally across the starting line we do that because it's not that we like to see a smoky burnout we have to put heat in the tires so that when 1300 or 1600 horsepower hits those rear tires they're good and warm they're good and sticky and the car will launch instead of spinning When it's time to go, uh, what's going on in the cockpit, what's going on with your, your body physically, all of that goes away it's because emotionally you're in there to beat the guy in the next lane. The fact that you're mechanically inclined and you've been doing a lot of the work on the car kind of lends you to start thinking about what could be happening or what could have been done. You, you kind of blow all that out of your mind and just let go of the electronic button that launches the car. And, and you floor it and let the computer do all the work going down the track. And all you have to do is push on the gas pedal and hold the steering wheel, but there's a lot of things that could start happening that could be uh, quite detrimental. The back wheels could break loose and they could start spinning. The guy in the next lane, he could start having an accident and he, he could get out of shape and he could come over and hit you. You've got to be watching him, watching the track, and you've got to decide as you're going down the track, you're only going four to four and a half seconds, but you've got to make a decision. Do I keep going? Do I let off the gas? After we get to the finish line, it's just time to knock it up in neutral, shut the engine off and let it coast, and it's time to turn off and find out how you did. We're talking races that are decided by thousands of a second at the finish line. I've lost races uh, I've had people go across the finish line two thousandths of a second in front of me uh, at 150 miles an hour. And you have to win six times in a row to get in and win a circle. That's a whole lot harder than it sounds. If you beat someone, you get to say, I put them on the trailer, they've got to load up and go home. So you're either loading up and going home at one o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday or one o'clock in the morning on Sunday morning, depending on how many rounds you go. The neat thing about drag racing is, as you get older, it doesn't take the energy that, say, soccer or football or basketball would take. You can still do it when you get older. Uh, the only thing you have to battle is the heat and then, uh, you know, a little bit of the effort for loading and unloading the cars. But I've raced against guys that were 75, 78 years old, and they beat me. Uh, so it's, it's not something that time on your body really takes away from you if you're in fairly decent health. So what happened? Okay, so we missed qualifying by six hundredths of a second. There's another race in four weeks. We'll go back and regroup and uh, look at some data and figure out what we're going to do in four weeks. So right now I'm a spectator and Mr. Murphy is going to win the race with his number one car. Calvin ran out by one thousand. They were both 33 on the tree. Calvin was dialed to 430, 
Actually, he ran out more than that. All right, now look at me and put it in layman's terms, which is that. Calvin went too fast. Okay, so we've had a great weekend. We didn't qualify, but we got a lot of information and we got the car down the track. And uh, quite frankly, I got the butterflies out because uh, after having a crash four weeks ago, I was a little concerned about doing it again. We're gonna be going back to Richmond. We got another race in four weeks. It really is the passion of the entire team that I'm most excited about. I'm looking forward to some more time with these guys. It cut on, it just didn't stay on. It just didn't stay on. It was surging. What do you think they could do that? I don't know. Maybe a... I got no idea. Oh, well, we got time to figure it out. Yeah, exactly. We're in Dinwiddie, Virginia, at Virginia Motorsport Park, which happens to be the home of PDRA. Uh, we're in our summer series right now, so it's the middle of July. Pretty daggone hot. We're in another three-day race. Right now we're waiting to for our second qualifier. We didn't do as well on our first qualifier uh, as we wanted to. We had some electrical uh, gremlins. We all jump on these things. When we have a problem with a car, it's not unusual to see three or four people hustling and bustling around getting parts and tools together to make it happen. It's a little hard when it's hot, but we have to cool these cars down between runs, fuel them up, change the nitro bottles, and and uh, test a few electrical systems to make sure everything's good for the next run. It's not a case of just parking the car and waiting till they call you again. When we're at the racetrack, probably one of the things that's most advantageous to me is the camaraderie that we share. You don't meet a stranger here. If you need a part, everybody will help you out. It's a close-knit family. It's just a group that even though they're competing, they jump in and help each other. Regardless of how competitive we may be on the racetrack, when we're in the pits, if you need help, you need a part, you're gonna stop and you're gonna help. And it, it's great to be here because you have a lot of friends that'll help you out if, if you're in need. And I've never seen, in all the years that I've been racing, well, I take it back, I saw one guy get knocked out, but. Uh, I've basically never seen anybody really get in a, an argument or a fight about a run. That's the part that makes it the most fun. It's a sport that you compete with people, but it's a family sport. I'm about 14 years old. I started racing when I was a little over four. I started racing by motorcycles and four-wheelers, and when I was about 10 years old, I started racing junior dragsters. Um, I love it because it's a family sport. My dad does it, my mom does it, my uncles do it. Everyone does it, so it's just kind of something that I grew up doing my whole life. The community here is great. I mean, it's just like a big family. Everyone's so welcoming, and you just feel so at home. Like You just feel like you're at your second home. It's very competitive. It's, very, it's a very self-demanding sport. You have to really be in within yourself, so I love it. It's a great sport, and yeah. I get very nervous when it's like the semis because at that point you're so far up and it's, it's really scary if you mess up because you're so close. But I feel like over time you get really good at controlling your nerves. So it's just something you get better at doing.
as drivers, we ask ourselves why we still do this. The bottom line is it's just a really, really exciting sport. It's only a four and a half second run, but the adrenaline that flows through you when, when that's happening is just unbelievable. Uh, it's, it's exciting and scary at the same time. Things go really fast. One minute you're sitting still, literally four and a half seconds later, you're, you're running 160 miles an hour. Racing is actually in my blood. It's, it's part of my life. I, I love it. I've done it since the 70s. It's strange. I've been doing this stuff for probably 40 years. But the first time I get in the car, every time, I'm a nervous wreck. But after I make a pass, it just seems like it calms you down. And then when you get to be able to get into the seat of that car and let go of that button, and it, the G-forces just sit you back in the seat, it's just unreal. I, I don't know any other way to explain it. I mean, I don't take drugs or drinks. So I guess this is what you would call my high. I've strapped into this race car, or a race car, um, for the better part of 40 years. And still, when I'm in the staging lanes, the next car waiting for that official to tell me to pull into that burnout box, I always give one last tug on my seatbelt to make sure I'm strapped in good. And as I do that, I can still feel my heart pounding. That feeling, um, I can't replace it. At least ways I haven't been able to find anything else that replaced it quite the way it does. You know, it still gets my heart pumping, it gets my adrenaline, and for those few seconds that we're actually making that run, you don't have any other worries in your life. You're not thinking about work. You're not thinking about finances. All you're doing is, is chasing that that adrenaline, that, that rush, you're trying to bring it back. And then the run does that for you. But when you're in competition and that wind light comes on, well, you're, you're 17 years old all over again. It, all of the years are gone and, and that, that's the same feeling. The next thing that happens is the wind light. The wind light's either gonna come on on your side of the track or the other guy's side of the track. There's nothing more exciting than your wind light coming on, especially when you didn't think you were going to win. 